All right, welcome to Newman Numismatic Portal. This is the six o'clock Eastern Time Friday session. Uh, Pete Smith is presenting on I Collect Weird Stuff, uh, an introduction to numismatic association items. Numismatic association items are related to collectors, dealers, and authors. Some are parts of groups of items like pinback buttons, numismatist mirrors, Civil War patriotic envelopes, trade cards and promotional items. Uh, some of the most fun items may be unique. Uh, Pete Smith is a longtime uh, numismatic author and collector. He's been active in the areas of uh, early copper, tokens and metals, uh, numismatic literature, and of course, numismatic association items that we'll hear about now. So with that, Pete, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Just a quick introduction to the title. I collect weird stuff is the label on a box that I have. And I throw stuff in there that don't fit in two by two holders, which turns out to be a lot of stuff. Um, so it's things that are, are not in the normal collectible area, but I'm trying to tell you folks about some of the things that you might find interesting to collect. So let's go to a story. This is a, this is a coin, this is, this is not an association item. There was a time in my life when I was a serious collector of US large cents, primarily the 1793 to 1814 early date series. This is one of the highlights of my collection, the 1793 Sheldon 15 variety. There are about 13 examples known, so it's rare and as I said, one of the highlights. Well, if you collect early date large cents, it's logical that you would collect the standard reference books to go with it. So these are two of the standard reference books, both by Dr. William Sheldon. Early American Sense was the first one. Then he came out, I think that was 1949. In 1958, he came out with Penny Whimsey, which has become sort of the standard reference for the early series of large sense, describes the dye varieties but has some stories to go with it. Uh, I realize that some people viewing this today are very familiar with Sheldon and some people may have never heard about it before. So I'll just mention that he was a psychologist who did work in human behavior. He classified people as well as classifying large sense. And in classifying people, one of the things, one of his projects was the Atlas of Men. This includes thousands of pictures of naked men. And his concept was that you could identify personality traits linked to body types. So we had this classification system, um, three scales from one to seven, and he'd come up with a person, he'd look at Len and say, uh, Len is a three, four, nine, or whatever. And, and then he decided based on that, that Len had a certain personality type. And he was well respected back in his era, um, not so much anymore. But this is a book that is not numismatic, but it's associated with William Sheldon. Thus, it is an association item. And if you're a large scent nut and a Sheldon nut, you might drift off into this area and say, I got to have his non numismatic titles. So I have five copies of his large scent books, five, five different editions, and three different books that he wrote that are association items that are not numismatic items. As I said, he kind of drifted out of favor. And one of the things that made that happen was a Sunday supplement to the New York Times Magazine of January 15th, 1995. Had some pictures of some people who were Ivy League students who may have had their photographs taken when they were going to Ivy League schools. The article is called The Great Ivy League Nude Posture Photo Scandal. And it basically debunks Sheldon and said that, you know, he was a quack, that there was no association between mesomorphs, endomorphs, and ectomorphs, and that uh, we should ignore that. I don't know what people learn in college today, but in 1995, he was on his way out as being an authority. Now this is sort of an association item with his Atlas of Men. So it's an association item with an association item with Sheldon. 
I was fortunate that at the time this came out, I knew that the article came out, so I didn't have to go chasing after it. I was aware of it at the time. I was working for an international law firm that had a branch office in New York City. I contacted the head of the file room of the New York branch office and said that I had an interest in getting a copy of this New York Times Magazine. And in a week or so, I got a copy in the mail. So it cost me nothing. That's one of the great ways to collect stuff is to recognize the importance at the time and save things at the time. I gave this presentation to my coin club a week ago and I said, I have no idea how hard it would be to, to find a copy of this today. So one of my coin club members went out and found three copies out on eBay currently available. And within the last week I've checked and yes, there are three copies of this article available on eBay at $20, $30 and $39.95. So if you want to have this to add this to your Sheldon collection, it is certainly possible to do. We're going to jump to a different thing. We're going to start with a Civil War token. This is a Civil War token issued by S.H. Zom. That's Samuel Hensel Zom. I said he was from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. One of my members of my coin club said that's not how they pronounce that in Pennsylvania. It's Lancaster or something like that. So however you pronounce it, he was the only person in that city to issue a Civil War token. So he's a local hero among the coin collectors. The item on the left is an NGC slab. That is the actual item for my collection. I put it on the scanner and it shows this round brown circle that has no detail. So the image in the center is actually not my coin. It's an image I got off the internet showing what the legend is on S.H. Zahn, Deer and Coins, Tokens and Medals. So he is one, one of a handful of coin dealers who issued Civil War tokens. And that's why I collect it because it's a token, but it's also associated with an early coin dealer. The item on the right is a medal produced by the Red Rose Coin Club, a tribute to Zam for, as it says, issued Lancaster's Civil War token. Uh, again, it's a medal, so it's a numismatic item, but in addition to being a medal, it's an association item because it's associated with somebody important to the hobby. During the Civil War, there were thousands of patriotic covers issued. These are thin paper. They're generally smaller than an envelope that we'd be familiar with today. Um, they were sent to soldiers who were active in the war at the time and soldiers wrote letters back home again. So they are highly collectible. It's an interesting contrast with most numismatic items where condition is what's most important. With Civil War patriotic covers, the ones that are used are considered more valuable than the ones that are unused. So these are three out of a number that were issued by Zam. I'll check my notes to see what the legend is because it's kind of hard to see. The top one shows an eagle attacking a buzzard or some sort of other bird. And they're making a play on the name of Davis. It says, a rare Davis wants to be let alone. So apparently this was a quote of Jefferson Davis about wanting to be let alone. And this is the Union Eagle attacking the Confederate bird, whatever bird that is. The second one again has an item, uh, an eagle, which I think is very interesting because it shows an eagle on a shield, which was also used on a pattern from 1792. And the eagle on shield is a very common patriotic theme. And the legend on that one is God bless our country. And the one below has an, a bird or an eagle carrying an olive branch and the legend is olive branch of peace. So these are Civil War patriotic covers issued by a coin dealer. So that is what makes them association items and what makes them treasures for me to collect. Zam also produced trade cards. 
These are generally from the 1880s. The one at the bottom says fine chromo cards. So chromo lithographic cards were a collectible thing from the time. They were advertising and advertisements for some firm. And a lot of people saved them, collected them. Uh, a lot of them were put in photo albums. So if the back is blank, you often may see glue residue on the back where somebody put them in a photo album. Same thing is true for the Civil War patriotic covers. They were often saved. And they were saved at the time they were issued, which is, again, as I said, that's the best time to collect. And there were people during the Civil War who were saving rebellion tokens or Civil War tokens and were saving Civil War patriotic envelopes. And enough of them were saved so that they're available to collectors today. These trade cards make no mention of him being a coin dealer. I don't know if he got out of the coin business by the 1880s, but he was more in the printing business and the book business. Uh, so it's not a numismatic item, but it's an association item. After I decided I was going to make this presentation to the new numismatic portal, portal, I was looking on eBay and I found this blotter from SH Zahn. And of course, I had to buy it. So I acquired this within the last month, basically, because I was making this presentation. So I will describe this Zahn collection as a vertical collection. And what I mean by that is that you pile things on top of each other. It's collecting several different kinds of things from the same person. And later I'll talk about some horizontal collections, which is collecting the same sort of thing from many different people. We're going to jump to another topic here, starting with a person. This is William H. Wooden. He served as Secretary of the Treasury under Franklin Roosevelt. He was a coin collector, specifically a pattern collector. He collaborated with Edgar H. Adams on this book. Um, I, I'm having trouble reading the title, and I'm sure you are as well. It says United States Pattern Trial on Experimental Pieces. So the, the cover didn't reproduce well, but it's one of the standard references on patterns. Adams was basically the person who wrote the book, and William Wooden was the person who collected, co contributed his collection of patterns to the book. So it's a not an association item, it's an actual numismatic book. This time cover becomes an association item um, in that it has no numismatic content, but has a picture of the Secretary of Treasury on it, and this was issued shortly after he was appointed Secretary of the Treasury. He lasted less than a year, um, and he was the Secretary of Treasury in 1933 when gold coins were taken out of circulation. So he's very important to numismatics at the time. And I checked this morning, and there's a copy of this Time Magazine on eBay today. So if you wanted to collect it, you could do that. Wooden ran an unsuccessful campaign for Congress in 1898. And as a collector of things related to Wooden, of course, I had to get this advertising card for his run and this ribbon for his run. He was unsuccessful. Um, but old political items related to somebody related to numismatics that makes them association items. This is an area that I think is a fun area. Um, these are sheet music uh, prints, print, uh, published sheet music. Uh, the one in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see says Franklin D. Roosevelt, and the back end of it is cut off. That's because the page is actually too large to fit my scanner. And generally, the sheet, sheet music is a little bit too large to fit on the scanner. But I think you get the general idea. Wooden was a composer. And one of the songs he composed was the Franklin D. Roosevelt March. And it was played for Roosevelt's inauguration. So I don't know how much this was ingratiating him to the president, but he did get appointed uh, Secretary of the Treasury. And he did write this sheet music for Roosevelt. This is for 1933. The other items shown here were earlier than that. The second item shown is sheet music for Raggedy Ann's Sunny Songs. Apparently Wooden and 
Johnny Gould, the, the creator of Raggedy Ann, were friends. And so Wooden wrote the sheet music, the music for this Raggedy Ann Sunday Songs book. Raggedy Ann had a community of friends. Raggedy Ann was a rag doll, sort of logically. Um, and there's Raggedy Andy, who is also a rag doll. But among the community was a wooden doll. And that wooden doll was called Little Wooden Willie. Now I find that amusing that Johnny Gruel would name us, us a character, one of his doll characters after William Wooden, but I assume that Little Wooden Willie was named after William Wooden. And I find it amusing to think of the Secretary of the Treasury as Little Wooden Willie. Uh, the other four you may notice all have the same title, Spring is in my heart again. As far as I know, the tune had no great popularity, but it was popular enough to have four versions of the sheet music printed. Uh, I think they were published in 1932. What this, I, I, I use this to illustrate the fact that I collect sheet music by dive variety. I was checking this morning to see on the availability and three of these pieces of sheet music are currently out there on eBay. And interestingly enough, I found another one that I wasn't aware of. So I'm gonna to have to go add to my sheet music collection to add another title. And again, these are vertical collections collecting a number of things relating to wooden. Waldo Moore was ANA president from 1919 to 1921. If you saw the slide when it came up, you already knew that. He's not one of the better known ANA presidents, but he was a collector of some interesting things. One of the things he collected was items valued at one cent. And he had quite a collection of checks written for the value of one cent. I think he may have wrote letters to famous people and said, I'd really like it if you'd send me a check in the amount of one cent, and I promise I'll never cash it. So he had quite a few one cent items, but he also produced these certificates, um, good for one cent, um, and that they're issued by the People's Banking Company, and he signed them. I'm not sure what his connection was to the People's Banking Company, if it was an actual bank or if it was just a figment of his imagination. I suppose I could do some research and figure that out. Um, he also issued these good for items for the Lewisburg Tobacco Company. And he signed them as secretary treasury, secretary treasurer of the Lewisburg Tobacco Company, which was a real company. They're in six denominations, one, five, 10, 25, 50 cents and a dollar. And these are considered depression script. And if you get the Neil Schaefer book on depression script, they're listed in there. So it, these are legitimate numismatic items, but I don't collect them because they're depression script. I collect them because they were issued for an a, a president. So some of these things that are I call association items may not strictly be association items, but as a Piece of guidance to you, I will say, collect what you want to collect and don't necessarily worry about the rules. It fits my collection, so that's why I have it. I mentioned that S.H. Zahm issued a number of Civil War patriotic covers. There are two other coin dealers who issued Civil War patriotic covers. The first, uh, row with the flags are by Robinson. Um, check, check, okay, I didn't, I just got my notes. Uh, this is Alfred S. Robinson. There's a book on Alfred S. Robinson, Hartford Numismatist. It's a title you might have in your library. It's about a number of the metals that he produced and he produced replicas of some rare coins. So he's a an issuer of replicas, or if you like to look at it differently, an issue of, issuer of fakes. But he was a dealer. Um, this is about half of my collection of the Robinson 
envelopes. The, the second row are also his with a kind of different series of designs. So I said, this is about half of my collection, but there are many others that I don't have. So Robinson patriotic items are fairly common, relatively inexpensive. I'm not going to mention the, the value of everything in my collection, but I would buy them at 15 to $30 a piece. And I suspect that you could go out there today and buy a number of Robinson covers if you like them for that kind of money. And they were saved at the time they were issued. So getting unused ones is not terribly difficult. The bottom row with the red, white, and blue US and USA were issued by Edward Kogan. His pieces are not as common as the Robinson pieces. He was also a more famous dealer. So being a more famous dealer and issuing rarer pieces, they tend to be a little bit more valuable. Um, but this is a, a related collectible that a lot of people who collect stamps collect the Civil War envelopes. And there is some crossover between numismatic items and uh, philatelic items. I first bought my Kogan envelopes when my local coin club shared a, a coin show with two other parts of the show. They had a stamp show and a, a sports card show all in the same auditorium at the same time. And I wandered away from the coin show and wandered into the stamp show and discovered these envelopes in the stamp department. So sometimes you can find cool things in the stamp department. Not everything has to be old. These are association items. They're pin bag buttons, obviously. And if you have ever had a button stuck on your shirt, you know what a pin bag button is. There are a number of numismatic related pin bag buttons. There are a number from ANA conventions. I picked out these seven because they all relate to people who ran for the ANA board. You may recognize John Wilson, Bill Horton, Cliff Mishler as people who were successful in their run as ANA president. Um, Arthur Fitz was successful in his run for vice president. His wife, Prue Morgan Fitz, was not successful in her run for governor. Um, Brian it was Brian Hendelson, who has a certain meaning for me in that he at one time owned the highest grade 1792 half dime in existence. Um, so I talked to him about that and I knew him before he ran for the ANA board. Um, Mitch Ernst was a guy I really liked when he was running for the ANA board. He dropped out of the race, so he didn't actually run, but he had some buttons made while he was still running. He distributed some of these at the Central States show that year. And then he went on to run for president of Central States and is immediate, immediate past president of Central States, which happens to be a good thing since they don't have a current president, or at least they were unable to get somebody to run for president this term. And I think Mitch is acting as president um, in the absence of an actual elected president. So I think I may have bought the Radford Stearns one as part of a larger group, but generally I got these for free at the time they were issued. And as I said, that's the best way to collect stuff. Recognize that it's important at the time it's issued and then hang on to it. A lot of this stuff is called ephemera because people have it for a while and then get rid of it or they put it in their attic and their mother throws it out thinking it's garbage. So if you collect association items, you're happy to have these and happy to have somebody preserve them. This is one of my fun areas, numismatist mirrors. And I suspect many people viewing this presentation has, have never seen a numismatist mirror. You weren't aware that such things were collectible. But some of you may actually be saying, well, but God, I have a large collection of these. Well, I think I have a large collection of these. I have about a hundred and I will claim until somebody contradicts me that I have the largest collection of numismatist mirrors in existence at about a hundred pieces. Each of these 
is about two and a quarter inches in diameter, so they won't fit in a two by two. And the back side of them is a mirror. Um, and it's a, a glass mirror. These are metal caps that are crimped over a mirror. Um, some of them are made professionally and some of them you can make at home. Um, there are kind of two different series of these and then some oddballs. So the first series of these I will mention were made by Ed McClung. And you notice the purplish one down in the lower left-hand corner with a stamp on it. It's got Ed McClung's name on it. The one next to it is EM Creations. And that was his company that produced these mirrors. So we'll go up to the top left, the Bernie and Cliff Roth. There's a little emblem in the bottom of the circle. It's got a circle with an EM in it and it says EM 74. So that's the trademark for Ed McClung's mirrors and indicates that this piece was made in 1974. You'll also notice that the Bernie and Cliff Roth one says collectors of mirror cards. So when I was going through my collection, deciding which ones to feature, I thought I'm gonna show this that there were people who collected mirror cards and had mirrors made to advertise that they collected mirror cards. But then I realized that the timing doesn't work and there weren't really a lot of modern mirrors issued at that point. So the Roths probably collected earlier advertising mirrors. There is a book by Hal Dunn on good for Western trade mirrors. I know in the 1890s, there were advertising mirrors often having an attractive woman on them and advertising some company. So there are people who collect the mirrors from the 1890s. Some of them were celluloid rather than mirrors. And when these new mirror cards came out, they would have collected them as well. But this is sort of a throwback to the old mirrors, but a new series. And the first I'm aware of, of this new series, were produced by Ed McClung in 1973. So let me check my notes for a minute here. Um, in 1973, he issued 12, I know this, but I'm, I'm having trouble finding it in my notes. Okay. Forgive me, I'm so well organized that I'm losing track of what I'm doing. Um, okay. Um, he issued 12 of these in 73, 43 of them in 74, and three in 75. So 74 was the biggest year of production. And by 75, he was no longer producing them. Um, I'm annoyed by my, this man. Okay, now, now I found the sheet that I wanted a minute ago. Um, so he produced about 50 different mirrors. Um, one of the people who produced a mirror in 74 was Lloyd Wagaman. And Lloyd Wagaman was the collector of transportation tokens. So he started showing these to his friends and a lot of people who were transportation token collectors then decided they should have a mirror produced. And so the second series of mirrors are for the AVA, American Vectorist Association. And I don't know how many AVA mirrors were produced, but fewer than 50. Some of them went to Ed McClung, but more of them went to a company called Badge a Minute. And you could buy a kit from Badge a Minute where you would get the metal cap, you'd get the mirror, you'd get a little ring and you'd get this device that sort of had a, a handle on it and a crank and it would crimp the edge of the metal around the, the glass. So you could put whatever you printed on a sheet of paper or a photograph, um, cut it into a circular form. Uh, there were six pieces to this badge a minute thing and you could make your own. So some of them might have been one of a kind or some of them might have been 12 issues or however many you 
and wanted to make. But the AVA mirrors are highly collectible by a handful of people in the AVA, but not generally collected outside the AVA. So I know two other people who collect AVA mirrors, but they don't collect the broader group of mirror cards. And the good thing about that is sometimes they've come across non-AVA pieces that they've sold to me. So it helps to collect things that other people don't want. Now I'll mention that three of these have encased scents, as you can see. Um, the ones produced in 74 would have likely had 74 cents. The one in the middle of the picture was issued by Vic Nolan. And what's significant there is that that has a scent dated 2001. So as recently as 2001, people were still having these made, but this, there are very few of them made after 1980. So the, the peak of these was about 73 to 80. And they must have been collectible at the time, probably not produced in very high numbers. They occasionally show up on eBay in singles, but putting a collection of these together is probably very challenging. I was fortunate to buy a couple of AVA collections that had good collections of AVA mirrors in them. And I was fortunate to buy most of the Ed McClung pieces from Ray Dillard, who had collected them at the time and sold me his entire collection. And again, that's a good way to buy up stuff. If you don't have the collection and you can find somebody who does have the collection and you can buy their entire collection, that's sometimes a good thing. Now, the bad thing is I also had to buy 100 pieces that I didn't want from Ray Dillard who were not numismatic related that were mirrors. So if you want to collect mirrors, I got a whole bunch of them that are non-numismatic that I, you can talk to me about. The two in the right, upper right, I find very interesting in that they're both for a company called Eagle Coin Company. One's in Fort Dodge, Iowa, one's in Owatonna, Minnesota. Both have an Eagle, both say buy, sell, trade. They look very similar. They're both made by Badge and Minute. So you might think that somebody produced both of those, but I don't know any connection between the two companies. I don't know that you know, the same owner owned both companies. I haven't been able to find any connection other than the fact that they had these very similar, uh, excuse me, my phone is ringing. Okay, I just hung up my phone, excuse me. Um, I don't know any connection between them. And the interesting thing is that I don't know of any other similar coin dealer mirrors produced for anything else other than these two companies. So why two that are so similar and no others? The one from Richard Townsend, the one that I haven't mentioned yet has an elongated coin on it. So this gets to the point that these can be collectible as mirrors, but if you collect elongated coins, you want a mirror with an elongated coin on it. If you collect encased coins, you want to get the mirrors with the encased coins on them. So it's a crossover collectible. The one with the stamp on it, again, if you collect encased postage stamps, you might want to collect that. But the big deal, the Maurice Gould one, you'll notice says good for 65 cents in cash. So this is a good for trade token. So if you collect good for trade tokens from California, you gotta have the more East School one. So they're modern pieces that kind of relate back to some older collectible field. So I collect them as a horizontal collection. Again, this is horizontal and then it's the same kind of thing from many different people. Um, they're association items because they're related to either people in numismatics or somewhere issued by coin clubs or coin dealers. Uh, so there's many different reasons to collect them. Do any of you remember phone cards? This was a highly collectible area for a very short period of time. Um, there was a time when people had phones that were connected to the wall and you have this cord running to them and you'd pick up the phone and you could walk four feet one direction or another on this cord. And then people started getting portable phones 
and some of them were big and bulky. And if you wanted to use a payphone somewhere around the country, you could get these phone cards where you could buy five minutes or 30 minutes or whatever and use them to pay the money in a payphone. And then of course, everybody in the world got cell phones and payphones went out of business. I am one of the few people in the world who does not own a cell phone. So I still have a phone. So the phone that just rang in my condo is connected to a box by a cord. Some of these phone cards were issued by coin dealers. Many of them were issued with colorful designs. Um, they were highly collectible by people who collected various topics. Um, there was, uh, Coin World had a magazine for a while, or a, you know, a monthly newsletter related to phone cards. Numismatic News had a newsletter for a while related to phone cards. They were a big deal around 1989. And then when everybody got a cell phone, they kind of disappeared. So these are a few that were issued by coin dealers in the name of the coin dealer, again, association items. The one in the lower left was issued by Art Kagan when he was running for the ANA board. And he says on it, uh, at 77, he can't afford to wait. So he was um, indicating that he was getting advanced in his years. And the, the one on the lower left is also a Kagan campaign piece. So again, a short run series. Um, if you collected them at the time, you might have had the opportunity to get them, but they'd probably be fairly hard to come by today. This again is a vertical collection in that it's three items issued by one person. And I was very happy to be able to get both the trade card and the, the larger round item, which by the way, that, that larger round item that says Grinnell Bro Bros Brothers is also a mirror. It's smaller than the previous ones I showed you, but it would be from that sort of earlier period, probably at least prior to 1950, when they were advertising mirrors produced for companies. And it's the only advertising mirror I have before 1973 that's coin related, but it doesn't say anything about coins on it. You have to know that Grinnell Brothers was the company owned by Albert Avery Grinnell and know that he was important in the paper money collecting field. The smaller round one, it's probably hard to tell what that thing is, but that thing on the, the button is actually a piano. So he had a piano on that picture of his company and then a trade card, you know, again, pretty woman, pretty young lady with this umbrella um, and a trade card in advertising the Grinnell brothers. There are a number of coin dealers who have issued trade cards. I only have four or five. Um, I've seen some others on eBay that I've passed on just because I wasn't in a buying mood at the time. Again, they were advertising items. If they have a pretty picture on them. People tended to save them, might have saved them um, in photo albums. Uh, not many for coin dealers, but I would say highly collectible when you can find them. These are some Thomas Elder items. Um, I have a number of envelopes and that's again, a, a very large collectible field. You can get many envelopes issued by coin dealers. Um, they appear on eBay constantly and some of them are what I consider overpriced. Some of them I think are good deals. I like this one because it's from Thomas Elder, but I also like it because it's addressed to Virgil Brand, which again, you should know that Virgil Brand was a very important collector um, in Chicago at the time. So if you can get an envelope from a coin dealer to somebody who's important, that's better than just getting the envelope by itself. The other item, the two big round circles, it's not obvious what it is, but this is a paperweight. So these are two photos of the same thing. Um, the bottom is flat, although this, the card part is inset in this glass hemisphere. 
and has the advertisement for Thomas Elder on it. The upper part, it doesn't show, but it's a glass dome, virtually like a, a hemisphere, kind of like the size of an orange. And embedded in the paperweight is an 1848 large scent. And there are various pieces I've seen with various dates of large scents in them. So I don't know, I don't know how many of these paperweights he had made. I haven't collected them by date. Um, a person might aspire to do that to see how many different large scents you could get in them. I've seen like three different ones, um, but haven't aspired to get others. Getting the one was enough. And they're inserted in a bed of macerated currency. And again, something you may not be familiar with, but when the Federal Reserve Bank gets currency back that they don't want to use anymore, they could burn it, they could bury it, or they could shred it into itty bitty little pieces. Apparently burning currency is considered a toxic material. And so they tend to not to want to burn it. So they shred it into little itty bitty pieces. And there are some little triangular pieces here that if you look at closely, you might be able to tell are pieces of currency that are ground up and put in this base of this paperweight. There are sculptural items made from macerated currency. I don't have any of them. I might at one time have wanted to get them, but they take up space. Um, they're somewhat expensive, but you can get uh, a bust of George Washington. You can get um, a boat. Um, you can get a number of things made using macerated currency, sort of a paper mache form. This was used for paperweights. You can also get little bags of shredded currency as souvenirs if you go to visit a, a Federal Reserve Bank. But again, this paperweight to me is interesting because it's a Thomas Elder advertising item. It's an encased large scent and I collect large scents and it's macerated currency. I don't collect macerated currency, but it's a good example of that. So it has multiple reasons for being collectible. I'm gonna to go to a couple of relatively older items here. Um, I said that envelopes are fairly common and one of the most common kinds of numismatic dealer envelopes are the SH and H Chapman envelopes. There are apparently hundreds of them that have survived and are available in the numismatic marketplace. So envelopes addressed to SNH Chapman are very common. And again, for those of you who are new to numismatics, Samuel Hudson and Henry Chapman were very important dealers in the last half of the 19th century. But what's important to this one is that it's from Ed Frossard and his imprint is on the upper left-hand corner. It's at an angle and kind of hard to read, but this is the only Frossard uh, envelope I've ever seen. So they're not real common. And when I had the opportunity to get one, I jumped at it. The odd shaped piece on the right, I should know how to pronounce this and I'll have trouble with it. It's again, a Frossard advertising piece, but it's on a piece of French paper money. Um, and I would pronounce it Assignat, but of course the front French don't pronounce the final consonant. So it's an Assignat or something like that. And I'm sure there are people watching who know all, all about old French currency who know exactly what I'm talking about. But these must have been fairly common if you would take one of these and overprint it with your advertising message and give them out to customers. They're not so common today and very uncommon with the frosted advertising on them. But I consider both of these treasures because of the, the frosted name because they're not very common. Another envelope, and again, this is a Civil War patriotic cover. Um, it's probably kind of hard to read the little writing across the top, but this is another Robinson piece. So Robinson produced the envelope. It's addressed to W. Elliot Woodward from Roxbury, Massachusetts, who again was 
a very noted numismatist from his time. We don't know who sent this, but it might have actually been sent by Robinson because Hartford is the postage, uh, the, the, the cancellation stamp. So we don't know it was sent by Robinson, but it was made by Robinson and sent to Woodward. The little card in the lower right is for the Mount Pleasant Apothecary store. Again, there's nothing on here that says William Elry Woodward, but if you've studied numismatics, you know that that was his other business. So again, this is a business card related, a relationship item to Woodward. So I consider these as being old 19th century items among the treasures of my association items. Somewhat more recent area are philatelic numismatic combinations known as PNCs for short. And there are hundreds of these, probably thousands of these where somebody produces something with a coin on it, a stamp on it and a cancellation on it. And they'll make these up for you and sell these to you for some advance over the cost of the postage and market them as being great treasures. And if you collect them, that's fine, enjoy them. Um, what I will say is it's pretty hard to sell PNCs on the secondary market. There isn't as much value perceived today as it was at the time they were issued. But to me, these are valuable because of the association. Each of these five has an elongated coin on it. So they were all produced by people who collect elongated coins and they're showing off their elongated coin along with something else. The top two, again, the OWL and the TEC logo, those are tech. Tech is short for the elongated collector. Um, so these are tech related items. Uh, they're ANA, uh, um, oh, the, the, the one with the blue circle has an ANA thing. Um, but I don't know what these things are. And this is a frustration to me is that these metal things look to me like mirrors. I don't have them in my mirror collection. If these are tech mirrors, I ought to have them in my mirror collection, but they're in sealed envelopes and the back is covered. So I can't tell if they're mirrors. I can assume they are, and I can sort of collect them as part of my mirror collection. But until I see one that's outside of the envelope, it'll be a mystery to me. I'm not willing to open the sealed envelope to find out, but it's a frustration. But anyway, the two mirrors are for, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> officers. One is Chet Rogers, one is Lloyd Wagaman. Um, so these were produced by officers of tech when they were officers, enclosed in these envelopes with a stamp. So again, association items, elongated items, mirror items, multiple combinations. The blue item, again, I think is a mirror. Um, and I got to bend over to look closely. Um, it was not produced for a person that was produced for the ANA convention. Um, but again, if it's a mirror and it's a tech mirror, I don't have it in my mirror collection. The one with the wooden nickel in it, and by the way, that, that round thing is a wooden nickel. Um, issued by Mr. Townsend. It's the smallest elongated I've ever seen, but that is an elongated coin. Um, so again, it's uh, an elongated piece, a wooden nickel piece, an encased piece, a PNC, all mixed up together. The one at the bottom, the name is on the elongate and I didn't make a note of it, I should have. Um, this person produced a number of these Christmas cards, basically with an elongated coin in them. I think these are hand colored. He produced relatively few of them. What's significant to me is that 
the elongated coin is a Morgan dollar. And there are very few Morgan dollars that have been rolled through elongated machines. So if you collect elongated coins by denomination, getting a Morgan dollar is a treasure. They do, are not available very often. But from what I've been able to research, the person who put this Morgan dollar in this envelope only rolled one of them. So this is unique. It is the only Morgan dollar with this emblem on it. So if you aspired to collect these things, you're out of luck because I got the only one and I'm not about to sell it. We're getting now to more modern things. Um, the thing on the left, which obviously is a circle within a circle within a circle, it may not be obvious what that is, but that's a cookie tin. So it's, I don't know, six inches across or something like that. And it was issued by the Chicago Coin Company and sent out around the country to various coin dealers who did business with them. So at the time, it happened that I worked for a coin company that did business with Chicago Coin. Um, they sent this cookie tin to the company. When Christmas was over and all the cookies were eaten, I inquired and said, you know, I really like that coin uh, cookie tin if you're just going to throw it away. And they, we don't want this stubborn cookie tin. So I collected it at the time. Um, the guy who runs Chicago Coin Company is Bill Bird. If you're a numismatic literature specialist. You may have been fortunate to visit Bill in his library. He at one time had an extensive library next door to the Chicago Coin Company. Since then he has auctioned off his um, library, but he's a friend of mine. And so um, I enjoy having the, the cookie tin as a reminder. I also put next to it a bag from the Chicago Coin Company. So again, it's a a horizontal thing. I was able to get two different things. Well, actually, I guess this is a vertical thing. It's two different things from the same source. Um, coin bags are a collectible field. There are thousands of different ones available. I have a few issued by coin companies. And again, work, when I worked for this coin dealership, virtually every day they get bags of silver coins coming in from around the company, country and many of these were in coin company bags. And we generally didn't want to send coins out in another company's bag. So we'd throw the bags in a box and I was able to go through those and pull out the ones that I wanted. I put together a set by Federal Reserve Bank. So I have 12 different bags, each issued by a different Federal Reserve Bank and you can collect them by denomination. There are coin bags that had gold coins in them. Uh, some are very rare, some are hard to come by, but you can also buy coin bags on eBay fairly easily if you just want to collect general coin bags. Uh, one bad, bad thing is that they tend to take up a lot of space compared to gold coins and two by two holders. So I have two banker's boxes with coin bags in them. This is just one example of a weird thing I have. I was going to do an exhibit at one time on grading coin bags, which I was going to call bag state. So I'd give them all a BS number. And an interesting thing about coin bags is you tend to not want them in mint state condition because if they're in mint state, they were never used. So you'd tend to want a VF or an XF one that had been used but hadn't been totally worn out. And when they get to be totally worn out and have holes in them and the coins would fall out, then they kind of become no longer valuable. So you'd throw them out. So generally collectible bags would be in bag state 20 to bag state 40 in case you want to collect them by bag state. Okay, I've gone through the visuals. I'm going to just review quickly. If you want to see more, here are some resources that are out on the Newman Numismatic Portal. These are all things that I've contributed to the Newman Numismatic Portal. First one is 
a manuscript for a book. It hasn't actually been published as a book, but it's available as a book in the Newman Numismatic Portal called Personal Tokens and Medals of American Numismatists. The mirrors are in there. Um, the elongated coins would be in there. Um, but a lot of things that are more like tokens and medals, you know, coin club medals issued for coin club presidents and things like that. Um, I have more than 8,000 personal tokens and medals of American numismatists. They're not available in photographic form, but there is a listing um, available if you want to look up or if you have one and you want to see what else that person issued, you can look them up on the portal. The second item is the Gene Trimble collection of personal chips. I didn't show you any personal chips, but a lot of members of the CC and GTCC, and I have trouble remembering that's Casino Chip and Gaming Token Collectors Club. They've since changed their name to uh, Gaming Token Collectors or something like that. But a lot of members of that club go to people who produce gaming chips and have a personal chip made that looks like a, a, a poker chip. And they're often done in low numbers like 50 or 100. Anything more than 100 would be, would be high number. And they go to conventions and they trade them. I went to the convention in 2004 and met Gene Trimble. At the time he had the largest collection of personal chips in the world. He had about 2000 items. Unfortunately for him, he died. Fortunately for me, I had a con contact with the person who was uh, disposing of his collection, and I bought his entire collection of personal chips. It was about 25 high, 25, uh, 2,500 items. The total collection was 7,000 items, so I have 4,000 items that don't relate to my collection still hanging around that I have no use for. So. The best time to buy a collection is when it's available, but sometimes you end up with stuff that maybe you don't want. Um, I did a photo essay on numism numismatist association items, similar to the, just, the talk I just gave. Some of the items I showed you are in this book. So there are some items in there that are not in this book, but if you're so fascinated by this topic, you want to learn more, you can go out to the numismatic portal and look these up. Again, I've got 100 numismatist mirrors and they're all in this form on the portal. You can look them up. All of my Civil War envelopes are on the portal. This is in an image collection, not a book collection. You can see an image collection of the piece in the stereo view collection. I didn't show you any stereo views, but they're highly collectible. And again, I mentioned that I only showed three examples of trade cards, but there are about 20 different, and I convinced Len to put them out there as an exhibit, as a book on the portal. So that's my presentation. I believe I have two minutes left for questions. Len, are there any questions for me? All right, we do have a few questions. Um, what are the flags on the top row of the Civil War covers? They're all country flags. Um, I can't identify them without looking at them. Each is, is the flag of a country and it's got the name written under the flag. All right, and another person asks, uh, have you created any weird numismatic items yourself? Well, I mentioned that I collect personal chips um, or personal tokens. So I have two that I took to the gaming token meeting to trade. I, there was an anniversary for the AVA that um, we got 25 guys to each do one. So I did one of those, but nothing weird. They're basically just common chip kinds of things. All right, and that's it for the questions. Um... Only two questions? <laughs> Uh, I might add that, uh, you know, Pete welcomes donations. I, uh, anytime you go to a coin show, you pick up these, uh, tokens that these dealers that you, I already, I always send them to Pete. I hope they're not all duplicate, but, uh, uh and I treasure them, Lynn. They're all wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm sure Pete would uh, welcome similar contributions because, uh, I certainly don't go to every coin show and I'm sure there's a, a lot out there that, uh, I'm missing. 
How many have you been to in the past year? Um, none. I don't even remember the last time I went to a show. But uh, I'm feeling better about the ANA, so uh, hopefully that'll happen. <clears throat> all right. I left, I left lots of time at the end for questions, but apparently yeah. we've used it all up. Yeah, we did. All right, well, uh, thanks, Pete. And uh, that'll wrap it up for today at the NMP Symposium. And uh, we'll start again at uh, 10 o'clock Eastern time, Saturday morning. Uh, our first presentation is Jonas Denenberg, who's gonna be talking about artificial intelligence as applied to coin grading. Um, so we'll see everyone at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. So All quick, right. Lynn, Lynn, how many people do I have left viewing? Uh, the number is lower. I'll, I'll let you know afterwards. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Talk to you later.